Well, I've seen it in bridesmaids <laughs> whose exterior says, I am so happy for my friend, but interior says, why not me? <laughs> I have seen it in workplaces, sports teams, and in myself, that feeling of why does she or he deserve so much, and why can't I have even a small portion? Why is she more beautiful, he more powerful, she more talented? These feelings are the feelings of envy. And in our series on the seven lively sins, we arrive at envy. Envy taps into our feeling of inferiority, of not having what we deserve or being able to reach our lofty goals. All of this... I think, puts the whole worship of Hollywood stars in some question. Maybe we like that feeling. <laughs> Maybe it's comforting to reside in those feelings of envy. Maybe envy plays in us all the time and we don't even notice it. In his book on envy, Joseph Epstein's first words are, of all the seven deadly sins, only envy is no fun at all. <laughs> to make a distinction between what we call jealousy, the fear of a rival or resentment and the dis-ease about another's ability, we see envy is wanting what someone else has. The envious are afraid of losing something by admitting to the superiority of others. And so look grudgingly and hatefully upon another's gifts or good fortune, desiring it for themselves. I know none of us have ever felt that here. Frederick Buechner, the theologian and writer, says, Envy is the consuming desire to have everybody else be as unsuccessful as you are. <laughs> and Nietzsche, the famous philosopher, noticed that spiritually small men, he used, he used that man word a lot, spiritually small man, he said, envied the spiritually large, saying the golden sheath of pity conceals the dagger of envy. In the second circle of purgatory, according to Dante, the envious have their eyes sealed from the sun. They can't look upon another's joy. Reduced to blind beggars living on alms, the envious sit amid the barren wilderness asking for charity from anyone who will give it. The lessons they are to learn are about love of neighbor and taking joy in another's success. They are cast below their station, blind beggars, unable to see joy until they learn in their hearts that ability. And Dante continues his amazing take on the sins in the inferno. The envious traitors in the inferno are immersed in ice up to their necks, separated from others, separated from the warm warmth of heart and soul, the give and take. They live without regard to the success of others. To envy according to Dante and to me, is to fear our own limits, to fail to give joy to those who deserve it, to fail to see our connectedness. In an article Joseph Kahn wrote years ago in the Boston Globe on envy, he used the Titanic as the symbol of human envy. He said, envy is the quiet and insidious force propelling much of human history, good and bad. Finally, the face that launched a thousand ships, envy, including the Titanic. Its face, more often than not, is what can only be called the last laugh. After all, he said, 
hell's punishment, referring to Dante, of the sin of envy is immersion in freezing waters. Iceberg dead ahead, Captain! In a way, he says, we can not avoid envy, none of us. Envious people like you and me on occasion will deprive others of their happiness so we feel better about ourselves. We will utter those childish words, it's not fair. <laughs> Losing sight of the difference between fair and reasonable and just. A holy triangle of parenting. <laughs> now the vineyard story which Scott Cooper told today. I know it's not exactly about envy or fairness. It is about getting into heaven. <laughs> the writers of the gospel were trying to remind people that it didn't matter how late they came to their relationship with God, that they would be received. A universalist notion, indeed. But in the story of the vineyard, the words, it's not fair, come through clearly. No one in the parable loses anything. And that's the irony of this parable. The people who worked all day got paid what they were expected to be paid. But the lousy good-for-nothings who came in at the last hour got the same pay. The only thing at work there is envy. Because it could not matter to the person who worked all day that the person who worked for an hour got the same pay. Now we all deal with this on occasion. But if we boil it down, if we boil it down to what is paid to the person next to us, if we live in envy of what they make, we lose our souls. And I think that's what this parable wants us to think about beyond the notion of getting into heaven, which if you want to take a purely universalist point of view, we will all be there one day, the first and last. But within that story is how envy casts an evil eye on those who have a good fortune, who have the good fortune to show up at the last minute and get paid. Now, I have that same feeling every time a lottery winner wins a ticket. <laughs> if I buy a ticket, they bought a ticket, they won. It's not fair, I say. Now, I can't say if I was in that vineyard that I would act differently. Why not me? There's a little wire into envy. I know envy in my life when I am least satisfied with myself, when I am feeling low or less about who I am, when I want to fill a hole that drills down into my ability to see the blessings in life, when I have some fantasy of a life better than the one I have. I know envy when I think I am separate from others, not just prideful, but unconnected, isolated, alone, distant from the outcomes of another's life. I know envy when I feel that I deserve something that others don't, that somehow I am deserving of more than I already have. Parents will recognize this as sibling rivalry. None of us know anything about that also, right? In an effort to win the maximum amount of love from a parent, we can go on to want something a sibling wants when we don't even want it. Play that out in a scenario in your family. Your older brother gets something. Your older sister gets something. You don't even want that something. 
but you make a big fuss about it. Happens in my house almost every day. There's a story that outlines this. It's about two brothers in India who are the richest, couple of the richest people in the world. One is ranked fourth richest by Forbes magazine, and one is ranked seventh. Mukesh Ambani, he is worth something like $42 billion. His brother is worth $30 billion. In a Shakespearean kind of tragedy, <laughs> they became at odds with each other because the younger brother wanted to be ranked higher than the older brother. So they divided their father's inheritance and they went at it. It ended in the courts. You can read about this. The one brother, the $42 billion brother, bought private jets and buildings that had 27 stories and helicopter pads and all kinds of things. The other brother bought DreamWorks Studio and all kinds of rights to movies. They got into an arms race for who could have more and who could make more. In the end, a friend of theirs said, Anil has been given a raw deal. There was a court case that separated his, him, uh, his business gain from his brother's. Even the English landed aristocracy would not have treated a younger brother so badly, they said. The relationship between them cannot get worse. The story of two brothers trying to outdo one another and the parable of the vineyard, which is said to be about heaven, points us, I think, more toward the heavenly disposition of the soul. And the real story of brothers trying to outdo one another for, through the, the force of envy. They lose sight of the real mission to live into the legacy of their father and their family and to love one another. All the same as a younger brother, I know that feeling well. It derailed me many times living into the mission of loving one another. And the parable of the workers includes that statement heard in all homes, it's not fair. The parable says, all are created equal in the eyes of God, loved, dignified, and righteous. And to miss this is to commit the sin of separateness. To imagine that some inherent, inherently are better than others. That God shines on some and not on others. This is an evil that was taught in the church. It has been taught to women. It has been taught to slaves. It is the legacy we still live in racism and anti-feminism. It is the erosion of our capacity to have a healthy, balanced self-love and to imagine that we are enough. It is that lesson that we must reverse. That notion that we are enough is important spiritually and has been preached here many times. So I want to conclude nearly with this quote from the film, As Good As It Gets. Do you remember that one? Jack Nicholson as Melvin and Helen Hunt as Carol. They're having a conversation in a car with their friend, a gay man who has been beaten senseless by his father and then finally paid to leave and never return. The kind of evil that is put upon our gay and lesbian friends seen as not enough by hetero people. Melvin is the symbol of envy. Carol says, okay, we all have these terrible stories to get over and you have to get over your parents and the horrible things that happened to you. And Melvin says, it's not true. 
Some have great stories, pretty stories that take place at lakes with boats and friends and noodle salad. Just not anyone in this car, he says. <laughs> but a lot of people, that's their story, he says. Good times, noodle salad. What makes it so hard is not that you had it bad, but that you're that pissed that so many others had it good. <laughs> no, that's not it at all, Carol says. No, says Melvin, the voice of envy. The story in this sermon is that envy happens, like that bumper sticker. It is a matter of how we let it freeze us or how we choose to turn it around, but we also, we all deserve a deep and abiding happiness, not to be immersed in the ice of envy, chilled to the bone, because in the end, we will never find comfort with ourselves if we allow envy to rule our souls, to destroy us from the inside out. Now, I don't believe in a purgatory such as Dante has outlined, except unless we remain in the spirit of envy, living out a purgatory in our lives. The only chance we have is to avoid this titanic, lively sin and to examine it in ourselves, to look in the mirror, to ask ourselves the kinds of questions that are on the back of your order of service. Have I been jealous of another's good fortune? Have I wished for another's demise? Have I dis have been discontented with my lot? Have I hoped for the downfall of anyone? To answer those questions honestly is to face the mirror, to see if envy freezes us from the inside out. Certainly, envy is not much fun. It's insidious. There are more fun sins. And in this series, they are coming like sloth and gluttony. <laughs> so let's look forward. <laughs> let's look inward and find hope and a grounding in heart and soul. We can do it. We don't have to be ruled by our envious hearts. We know within is the good soul. Good luck and good wishes. Amen.